go into those presentations and before I introduce the two presenters, I would like to welcome and introduce um, Mr. Joost Schmallenbach from the German Embassy, who will give us uh, some opening remarks. He will speak from the podium. Thank you, Talia. Uh, distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen, friends of the German Embassy. Um, we all know it's impossible to predict the future, but if you want to give it a try, you try it with ISS. So, Otilia, who is going to win the ANC elective conference? <laughs> Test me. <laughs> um, you might ask yourselves, why is the German embassy funding a project on African futures? Because Africa matters to us. It matters to Germany and it matters to Europe. Um, it's simple, but it's also complicated at the same time. Just to give you perhaps three reasons why I say it does matter what happens in Africa to what happens in Germany. Um, Africa is a continent full of opportunities. Uh, if we look at the uh, demographic development, uh, wealth of natural resources, and a growing middle class, um, so that might give rise to a growth market that is gigantic in proportions. Again, however, we face a lot of challenges if we look at the continent. Poverty and unemployment, <coughs> urbanization and environmental degradation, corruption, conflicts are threatening development, security and stability of the entire region. So the consequences of crisis in Africa have a direct impact on Europe and Germany. If, just to give you an example, the South African government changes the rules for migration, that can be felt in Europe. So what matters here matters to us. And last but not least, African countries, the African Union, their regional, its regional organizations are important partners in the international economic and political arena from crisis prevention to peacekeeping, from promoting the rule of law to supporting regional integration, from the fight to, uh, against corruption to fostering economic growth, from increasing academic cooperation to tackling, tackling climate change together. We are doing that at the moment in Bonn, for example, in very close cooperation with the South African government. Germany tries to design its policies to find partners in Africa. Look at what we did uh, through uh, the G20 chairmanship and the Compact for Africa. So just three quick introductory remarks why we are funding such uh, exciting uh, work on African futures. Um, let me finish by saying thank you to Julia and Zachary for their work. They've briefed me before, so I got a private briefing. I thought it was uh, uh, extremely interesting and extremely valuable for our work. So um, thank you to the Heinz Seidel Foundation and to ISS for um, having the German embassy on board as a partner. And I'm looking forward to hearing from the two experts. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joost. I will not be predicting who will win the ANC elective conference. That's in 2017, not 2035. We will now turn over to the presentation by Dr. Julia bello Schunemann, together with Zachary Donnerfeld, which looks at Africa's future uh, going to 2035 and revisiting the, the, the key trends that I listed earlier. Um, without, much, without wasting much of your time, I'll quickly hand over to you too. Thank you very much, Otilia, and thank you all for coming. It's good to have a full house. We're very pleased to speak today to you about um, Africa's future to 2035. Um, Zachary and I, we're going to swap to make it lively and uh, interesting 
Um, so we already heard a few teasers from Otilia and um, Joost. Basically, the key takeaway from our report, Trends 2035, is that living conditions are improving in many places across Africa, but not everywhere, not for everyone, and certainly not fast enough. So there's lots of structural challenges, including poverty, the disease burden, problems relating to human capital, access to infrastructure, and so on and so forth. But there are also lots of opportunities. So governments need to make more strategic investments to improve development prospects for all. That is the overall message. And we're obviously going to dive in to what that means. And um, so just to say, it is not unreasonable to think of a prosperous Africa in the future. But there are lots of ifs, and we're going to explore these. Right. So the key trends we identified in our report, and they apply in one way or another to the whole continent, but they obviously you know, have different implications for different countries and regions. Um, so one is that population growth on the current trajectory in Africa is outpacing economic and social development. By 2035, more Africans are likely to live in extreme poverty than today. Most of Africa's economies are not growing fast enough to change that. Urbanization, in principle, a good thing, does not necessarily drive economic growth and development. Also, Africa is likely to remain relatively isolated both from the global economy and across its regions. On the conflict or security side of things, overall conflict in Africa is causing fewer fatalities than during the 90s. But the number of violent incidents is increasing and violence is becoming more complex and hence more difficult to resolve. Democracy, on the other hand, is likely to remain very popular among Africans. Right. Um, so thank you, Julia. Thank you uh, as well to all of you for coming and Otelia and Yust for the uh, warm opening remarks. Um, a lot of we often get asked how we, um, you know, reach these conclusions about the future. Um, and thank you, Yust, for for uh, underscoring the point that it is, uh, you know, n w <laughs> nobody the the future is inherently unknowable. We we don't believe that we can predict the future, but we do think that there are uh, structural changes um, taking place that allow us to say things about the future with confidence. Um, and I will walk you through a bit of how we do that right now. Um, and how we do that is with a tool called the International Futures Forecasting System. Uh, it's housed and developed by the Frederick uh, S. Pardee Center for International Futures at the University of Denver. Um, and we use it for uh, a few different um, uh, kind of types of analysis. Uh, so the, the first is that it's a major database. Um, IFS holds over 4,000 data points for 186 countries going back to 1960 where available. Um, and we are able to forecast over 500 variables uh, to the year 2100. Um, so this massive database allows us to um, look at historical trends and figure out uh, kind of what the current state of uh, each of these respective development systems is and how we got to where we are today. Um, it also helps us understand how those uh, human, social, environmental, uh, and kind of physical systems uh, interact with each other and how that relationship changes over time. 
And finally, uh, it helps us shape the way we think about the future through a scenario analysis component. So it allows us to ask questions like, what if Africa decided to invest more in health or education um, versus uh, investing more in infrastructure? Uh, what happens if there's a major drought in Ethiopia? Uh, things like that. Um, we can help. Uh, get a better idea of what the implications of um, certain investments or uh, um, you know, major events will be. Uh, the tool is really a kind of model of models. Um, we start with demographics because demographics is a major driver of all these other systems. Uh, we base our demographics model off the UN Population Division. Um, we get a lot of our data from the United Nations as well. There's an economics model that is closely linked to the demographics model uh, that has a social accounting matrix and you know if there's any economists in the room I'm happy to talk about the Cobb-Douglas production function and whatever else you want afterwards but I won't bore the rest of you with the, the details. Um, our education model is based on the UNESCO Institute for Statistics. Uh, a lot of their forecasting and a lot of their data is incorporated into IFS. We work very closely with the World Health Organization to develop our health model. Um, and these are what we kind of view as the key human systems uh, within IFS. We also have what we would call physical systems. So we have an infrastructure model that uh, also uh, has a demand side component, which is a unique aspect of IFS. Um, even the World Bank doesn't have an infrastructure demand model. So a lot of infrastructure uh, advocates find that uh, a very interesting part of the tool. Um, our agriculture data comes from the FAO. We uh, use a, a, a pretty wide mix of sources for our energy model, which is tied very closely to the environmental model. And then technology is kind of a cross-cutting theme across all of these issue areas. And then we have some social systems. So we have governance components, finance components, um, and international politics. And what's different about IFS to a lot of other models out there is that all of these systems are connected. They all speak to one another. And uh, a few of you in the room have heard me give this uh, example before, so I'll keep it brief, but I think it's useful to talk about the way we think about population. So to forecast population, you only need to know four basic things. The current age structure of the population, the number of births, the number of deaths, and the flows of migration. But to get a more robust forecast, it helps to think about what drives the number of births. And that's affected by, among other things, access to contraceptives, levels of income, and levels of female education in particular. Um, deaths, on the other hand, are affected by access to clean water, access to improved sanitation, uh, the prevalence of communicable diseases. So in this model, all of these components of development interact to produce a, deny, uh, sorry, a dynamic forecast that uh, moves beyond just a kind of linear extrapolation of previous trends. So with that behind us, we now move into the more interesting part of the presentation. Um, and this is just to kind of let you know uh, how we reach these conclusions and uh, what the tool is kind of all about. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. So, yeah, he made the point that we don't just make it up. And um, he also made the point that um, population drives literally everything, affects everything. And this is why we're going to start here, demographic futures. Um, <clears throat> so when we talk about demographics, there's three things that matter. The population side, the population growth rate, how fast the population grows, and the population age structure. So let's look at the numbers first. Um, <clears throat> So here on this slide, um, we are talking about population increase in Africa versus the world. And Africa is divided into Sub-Saharan Africa and North Africa. North Africa is the yellow um, and um, Sub-Saharan Africa, the blue. So Africa is, Africa's population is the fastest growing globally. Africa is going to account for half of global population growth over the next two decades. 
in absolute numbers that means that from 1.2 billion people in 2017 approximately we are going to go to 1.8 million people in 2035 and we have a quite a lot of confidence in the demographic forecasts because of the drivers Zach talked about so you know I'm not saying this is going to be <laughs> exact but um, we have a lot of confidence in these forecasts so that means we are going to see a 50 percent increase over the next 18 years in Africa's population there are certain countries where that increase is even more stark say Nigeria is expected to see a 70 percent increase during the same time period. Africa's population in total is going to surpass India's or China's by 2035. So if you look at the numbers, that is just a lot of additional people. And what that means is that the demand for services will increase, increase very dramatically. And we can talk health, we can talk education, we can talk land, we can talk access to basic physical infrastructure such as clean water, proof sanitation facilities, roads, you name it, electricity, and so on and so forth. Um, Africa's urban population is growing even faster than its rural population, even though the rural population is also continuing to grow. So the implications of you know, these, all these additional peoples are quite obvious, just massive increase in demand for services. But that's not the only thing that matters. As I said before, the age structure of the population is also critical. So even by 2035, half of sub-Saharan Africa's population is expected to be under 21 years old. I think at the moment, half of the population is under 19 years old. Just to put it into perspective, in Latin America, half of Latin America and the Caribbean's population is under 30 years old at the moment. By 2035, uh, we expect a figure of 36 years. Germany's figures respectively are 46 and 50 for 2035. So there's huge differences, right, across countries and world regions. So <laughs> the age structure of the, um, of the population has many implications, has financial implications, economic implications, and social implications. And um, there is an academic called Chinkotta. He talks about the demographic transition, and he talks about the bad news, good news, bad news story to describe the different phases of the demographic transition. So what is that? What is bad news? What is good news? What is bad news again? So the bad news part of the demographic transition is a lot of young people children that are economically dependent, that a relatively smaller workforce has to look after. The good news story is when that ratio changes and we have a bigger share of the population that is actually working and a relatively speaking smaller share of the population that is dependent, children but also the elderly. The bad news story again, and this applies to countries like Germany, Japan, and, and so on and so forth, is when, we, when the share of the population that is working, again, is relatively small in comparison to the share of the population that is dependent. Now, in these countries, we're talking elderly people rather than children, because they don't have enough children. So Africa, for the most part, is still stuck in the bad news part of the story. Too many young people that are dependent on a relatively small workforce. But it is changing, right? So that ratio between dependence and economically active 
people is changing for the better. And that is the much talked about demographic dividend. That demographic dividend talks about that ratio. And this slide shows you that ratio and the demographic dividend. So we're comparing Nigeria, South Africa, Cape Verde with um, the group of Africa's low-income countries and Africa's lower middle-income economies as classified by the World Bank. What you can see is that <laughs> the onset of the demographic dividend is delayed for most of Africa's economies. Africa, lower middle income, and Africa, low income. So that will be the red line, and the, it's not the green, it's the brownish line. Okay, South Africa is further ahead in the demographic transition, and Cape Verde is as well. So the onset of the demographic dividend is expected earlier. Nigeria, on the other hand, is even lagging behind, you know, the average for Africa's low-income economies and Africa's lower-middle-income economies. And, and they are only expected to see a demographic dividend well into the second half of the century. Now, but what does that mean? And also, you know, it basically means the good news part of the story I talked about before is not happening fast enough um, on the continent. Um, the other problem is that the demographic dividend, once it's there, it's an opportunity, but it's not a given. It does not produce economic growth and development by itself. And this is probably the, <laughs> the bigger problem on the continent, that the conditions to benefit from a more favorable age structure of the population are not in place. So what we need is much more aggressive investment in human capital and job creation to be able to capitalize on a more favorable age structure of the population. Um, so that w that's sort of from the policies that what needs to happen to be able to capitalize on the demographic dividend. At the moment it is delayed and that has to do with the extremely fast population growth. So I want to show you, you know, what will happen if Africa or certain regions, we model this for certain regions only, manage to bring down fertility rates um, and how it would change, you know, the population age structure and therefore the onset of the demographic dividend. So basically here we're looking at Central Africa and Western Africa because these are two of the regions with very high fertility rates. So if they brought down fertility rates from a forecast average of 3.8 births per women by 2035 to 2.4 children per woman, the onset of the demographic dividend could be brought forward. Well, I mean, the onset would be a lot earlier. It would fast track the onset of the demographic dividend by about three decades. Also, the demographic dividend would be higher and the window of opportunity to capitalize on it would stay open for longer. Um, we can talk about this a bit more if you're interested in the, in the Q&A. Um, <coughs> But so far, Africa's extremely fast population growth is likely to compound extreme poverty in sub-Saharan Africa because it is outpacing economic growth. 
All right, thank you, Julia. Um, I think that was a good um, uh, a good framework to to go for us to go through the rest of this analysis because um, it it helps put you know it helps to keep that uh, what Julia said at the beginning of this presentation in mind is that things are improving. They're just not improving fast enough. And within the context of this rapid population growth, it's putting enormous pressure on uh, service delivery and things like poverty. So this is a breakdown of um, what poverty looks like in 2016 across Africa. Um, these are very arbitrary groupings. Um, we <laughs> like. I just want to say that any amount of poverty is is a lot. So the the low, medium, and high are are you know just kind of uh, categorizations, um, and they're not meant to indicate uh, any kind of normative condition. Um, it shouldn't be too surprising that the majority of poverty is isolated in in what we what we're calling high poverty countries. Um, but even in quote unquote medium. Uh, Poverty countries like Zimbabwe and Tanzania, um, you still have you know more than 40% of the population living below a uh, dollar ninety a day, which is how we're defining poverty um, throughout this presentation, in line with the uh, not so recently adjusted World Bank um, classification. Um, and I think this 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 graph um, really illustrates Julia's point. What you have uh, in the blue line is the percentage of Africa's population living in poverty. What you have in these orange bars are the absolute number, so the millions of people. So despite the fact that poverty is set to decline from you know, about 50% in 2000 to about 30% in 2035, the absolute number of people living in poverty is going to, or is forecast to increase by about 200 million um, between 2015 and 2035. This is an enormous challenge. Um, you know, this is a basically equivalent to Nigeria's population today. Um, and it will be, you know, it's, this to me is, is, is the essence of the story, right? Is things are getting better, but this is happening within a, within a context that uh, is making it very difficult to achieve rapid progress in areas like health, education, and access to basic infrastructure. Another consequence of this is that poverty is, um, if you will, uh, becoming increasingly uh, concentrated in Africa. So this is a uh, graph of uh, poverty over time in Africa versus the rest of the world. The world is these light blue lines, um, and Africa is these purple lines. A lot of this reduction, um, as we all know, is due to China's progress um, during the Millennium Development Goal phase. Um, but it also underscores the broader trend um, that poverty is increasingly becoming African. And this is, um, you know, you know, poverty is both a symptom and a cause of underdevelopment and uh, plays a, a very influential factor um, across a number of the areas that we'll talk about throughout the rest of this presentation. So that was a, a quick little bit on poverty. Um, I'm going to stand up here. Do you mind if I stand up here? You can stand here with me. It's fine. Um, Right, so I think Zachary yeah, he illustrated the point um, I was making that um, the rapid population growth is really is really a, a very big challenge um, to keep improving. Um, I want to talk a little bit about urbanization, and um, I mentioned before that um, urban Africa's urban population is growing even faster than Africa's rural urbanization. So traditionally, urbanization is, is, is associated with economic growth and dynamism, um, so it's, it's considered a good thing. And I'm not saying it's not. Um, let me give you some figures first. Um, so <clears throat> this slide shows just the um, trajectory we are on um, between now and actually 2050. So um, 
by 2035, more than half of Africa's population is going to live in urban areas. Um, by 2050, it's about 60% of Africa's population. So Africa is the fastest urbanizing continent in the world, but that's also because it's coming from a low um, base. Um, what does that mean again? It means that you know there is great pressure on service delivery, um, infrastructure and land to be expected in urban areas. So the urban transition certainly has the potential to accelerate economic and social development, but again, there is a few structural hurdles um, that don't make this a obvious um, future or <laughs> development. So, you know, the question is, will African countries be able to reap the potential benefits of urbanization? Again, it depends if they manage to overcome these structural hurdles. And um, I want to talk a bit more about what these are. So basically, um, there's a lack of job creation and productive employment opportunities. There is slow economic transformation to higher productivity sectors. There is poverty and inequality, not to forget. And there is also violence. All these are structural hurdles that are in the way of the sort of <clears throat> the urban opportunity, if you like. Um, so in Africa, the, the link between urbanization and economic development is much weaker than elsewhere in the world. And it has to do with the circumstances in which it is happening. Basically, Africa is urbanizing at much lower income levels than other world regions. Um, so poverty also seems to be urbanizing, means that the poor are moving to the cities quicker than the overall population. And also, much of the urban population growth is actually natural urban population growth. It's not just people moving from rural areas to urban areas, but 70% of um, Africa's urban population growth is actually due to the growth happening in urban areas, which means that women still have many children even though they live in urban areas. And even though, you know, in other world regions, fertility rates come down, typically women would have fewer children once they live in urban areas because they would be, um, they would have a different kind of employment um, and so on and so forth. But in Africa, we don't really, we don't really see this. And um, my take on this is that poverty is, is one of the main, poverty in a, in, a, in a broad sense is one of the main drivers of why um, fertility rates in urban areas um, are still very high. Anybody knows what this is? It looks good. Hmm? It's Lagos. Um, this is where I live, but not, not there. <laughs> right, and it's not finished, actually. But why am I showing you this? It's because I want to say something about urban governance. And the urban governance we tend to see, and the urban governance we, we would need to overcome some of these structural hurdles I been talking about. So there is a lot of examples for urban governance that caters to the wealthy, especially in Africa's mega cities that are admittedly drivers of, of growth. And you know, some of them mega cities defined as having more than 10 million people. At the moment, we have three of these, Lagos, Cairo, and um, Kinshasa. And by 2030, we are likely to have six adding Joburg, um, what's it called again, Dar es Salaam, Luanda. and um, Luanda, right, thank you, Zach. 
So, <clears throat> but, you know, these kind of projects, this is Eco Atlantic, massive investment built for millions of people. A new city is a city, and it's fine. But we also need to make sure that the urban governance addresses the problems of the majority, right? Because if not, we're just going to reinforce patterns of marginalization, um, poverty, inequality, and so on and so forth. So <clears throat> I'm not going to show you how the majority of the people in Lagos live because we, we all see that all the time, right? Makoko and other places. I mean, I'm picking Nigeria because I'm biased. Um, so we need urban governance that caters to the marginalized. Um, and I'm not saying it's either or. <laughs> Handing over. Um, so on that note, uh, I think um, one of the things, <clears throat> maybe a, a, a phrase I like to use in the context of urban planning and urban governance is this, the idea of this unplanned urbanization. So <clears throat> this urbanization is occurring within a rapid context and, um, you know, in theory, if you have more people that are closer together, it should be easier to provide those people with services. But if those people move to places where those services don't exist and this infrastructure doesn't cur currently um, exist, like uh, a lot of informal settlements, then actually providing services to those people becomes significantly more complicated because now you have to uproot hundreds of thousands of people, find a new place for them to live temporarily, and then resettle them while you're making all these massive investments in infrastructure. So, um, you know, this, this idea of, of strategic and long-term urban planning is something that I think uh, should be involved in, in more conversations. Um, <clears throat> So this is uh, what we would call uh, a, the infrastructure deficit, um, and it shows four different categories of access to infrastructure, uh, sanitation, clean water, electricity, and paved roads. Um, paved roads is just kind of a proxy for, um, the, you know, the sophistication of your uh, transportation infrastructure. Um, clearly in 2016, uh, access to improved sanitation lags well behind other developing regions. Um, even South Asia has nearly double the access of Sub-Saharan Africa in 2016. And the picture doesn't improve too dramatically um, in our forecast out to 2035. Uh, in our forecast, less than 60% of people in Sub-Saharan Africa will have access to electricity, less than 50% will have access to improved sanitation, and less than 80% will have access to clean water. Um, these are all millennium, or sustainable development goals, um, and in our current path forecast, uh, Africa falls well short um, on all of them. But that's not to say that there isn't progress, and this will look similar to the graph that I showed on poverty, but it's, it's actually different. Um, this is uh, levels of access to unimproved sanitation. Um, so this is people uh, who aren't using what the WHO and UNICEF would define as uh, improved sanitation. And by improved sanitation, I'm not talking about a flush toilet in every house. Um, there's six or seven different types of sanitation facilities that are considered improved. Um, the, I don't remember exactly <laughs> off the top of my head. Um, but the, the trend here is similar to poverty. You see nearly a 20 percentage point reduction in people using unimproved sanitation facilities, but the absolute number grows uh, by about 300 million. So you have 300 million more people in 2030 um, using sanitation facilities that are more likely to facilitate the transmission of communicable diseases. Um, this is a major cause of women dropping out of school early, which um, you know is a, is a factor to uh, the demographic dividend and fertility rates. Um, it also has implications for stunting. <coughs> 
So stunting is not something that can be reversed. Once a child is stunted, he's, he or she is stunted for life. Um, and re relying on unimproved sanitation facilities um, is, a, you know, is, a, is a big driver of uh, malnutrition, which is, is, is a cause of stunting. Um, this, uh, this leads to um, something that I think is important that uh, is, also, is also a bit of, like, it's a, bit of a nuanced point. Um, and here's where I think we've, we've, been, <laughs> we've been pointing out a lot of ways in which Africa needs to do better. Um, but I think it's important to point out, at least with respect to uh, health systems in Africa, that Africa's been extremely unlucky. Um, if you look at the global breakdown of malaria deaths, um, the two thirds of them happen in sub-Saharan Africa. And that's just, that's just an accident of geography. Um, the mosquitoes that live in Africa are more likely to transmit malaria. And, you know, granted the policy response hasn't, you know, been, you know, that leaves a little to be desired. Um, but this is an enormous challenge and children who suffer from malaria, you know, they're also more prone to contracting non-communicable diseases later in life. They struggle to um, uh, deal with things like undernutrition and stunting and things that I was talking about earlier. Um, sorry, I've just I realized I've been talking about malaria and this is HIV AIDS. You could have just told me, Attili, instead of whispering to Julia. Um, all right. So, but that just underscores my point because what I'm about to show you is malaria deaths. Um, and this is, I mean, this is overwhelmingly, um, you know, concentrated in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, I'll also say that HIV AIDS hit the continent in a way that it didn't hit other world regions, um, and particularly Southern Africa. I mean, if you look at figures for life expectancy over time, the dip in life expectancy that happened in Africa during the HIV AIDS epidemic is something we only, other see, we only see when there's a major conflict, like, and hundreds of thousands of people die. Like, it's hard to overemphasize how um, how much that has impacted the medium and long term future of Africa's workforce, its productivity, and just general development in the region. Um, so this is a uh, overview of the communicable disease burden by region. So this is all the WHO communicable diseases rolled up into one category. People in Sub-Saharan Africa are more than, are about three times as likely, or three times more likely to die from a communicable disease as the next uh, most affected region, being South Asia. Um, this is not forecast to improve significantly, although the rates do come down uh, over time. Now, I wanna say something about uh, what we would call vertical um, health programs. Now, I've spent the last few minutes talking about how important communicable diseases are and how negatively they can impact uh, other areas of human development, and I, I stand by what I said two minutes ago. Uh, but the programs that are uh, designed to eliminate communicable diseases may have some unintended consequences. And this emerged from some research we did last year. and. I mean, just if, if you think about it, the quicker you get rid of communicable diseases, the faster the disease burden is going to shift to non-communicable diseases. And this could leave health systems in Africa really underprepared to deal with these causes of mortality and morbidity that are significantly more expensive to treat, diagnose, and manage, and also have impacts on productivity. So if you get a communicable disease, you are, I mean, statistically speaking, communicable diseases are more likely to result in death or mortality. Non-communicable diseases uh, manifest more often in what we would call morbidity. And this impacts people's day-to-day -day lives. It affects their ability to productively participate in the workforce. And this can happen um, 
not only to children, but it can happen to 30, 40, and 50 year olds who are, uh, you know, ostensibly part of the workforce, but may not be operating at their full capacity. So, the point of all this is that programs designed to address communicable diseases, as valuable and as important as they are, are going to lead to a kind of fundamental shift in the causes of death in Africa. And it's important to recognize that that's going to happen if these programs are successful. And if we're measuring them and determining if they are successful, then we should be anticipating how the disease burden is going to change over time and uh, start thinking about policies with that in mind. So after that tangent, we uh, get to what everybody's really interested in. Right, so we've been looking at um, many of the structural <clears throat> challenges and conflict and violence is obviously another one of these structural challenges that affect development and stability and the prospects for the continent. <clears throat> so, as I said at the beginning, the picture again is, is mixed, like overall, conflict in Africa is causing less fatalities than during the 90s. It's like, it's like the peak period after the end of the Cold War. However, the number of incidents is increasing and violence is becoming more complex. What we see when we, we can't forecast the onset of conflict the way we forecast demographics or access to infrastructure or even economic growth because it's just something extremely difficult to, to forecast or to predict. But that's why we tend to look at what drives conflict and what are the structural drivers of conflict and some of these we are able to, to forecast with a, I would say, reasonable level of, of confidence, right? So what we see for the future is that <clears throat> the trend is away from armed inter and intrastate conflict to higher levels of riots and protests, as well as violence associated with terrorism and organized crime. And obviously, I mean, these trends, they will differ significantly across and within countries. So this is a big picture trend report, right? So um, we're glossing over a lot of details that are obviously very relevant if we look at country or regional context. Um, so what you see on this slide and this data comes from, the, from ACLA, the Armed Conflict Location Event Data Project at the University of Sussex. They count incidents, it's incident data it's not fatalities. But what it shows you basically is that there has been an uptick, right? <clears throat> Between 2013 especially and 2016. So there, there has been an uptick in the violent, in violent incidences. And um, ACLED, they count, I mean, they have different categories and um, different event types if you want. The most common event types in 2016 were, in descending order, riots and protests, violence against civilians, battles, and remote violence use of IEDs. Um, if we look a little bit at the sort of country level, the most battle events were fought in Somalia, Libya, and Nigeria. Somalia was also host to the most remote violence incidents on the continent, and South Africa, on the other hand, had the highest amount, highest um, number of protest events um, in that year, followed by Tunisia, Ethiopia, and Egypt. Um, on the next slide, I want to say something about the complexity or the changing, the changing nature of conflict. So. Conflict has historically been more between the state and opposition groups, but increasingly the picture is becoming 
mess here, right? There's political and communal militias and unidentified armed groups that play a prominent role. I mean, look at, for example, <coughs> the Sudans. Um, the other thing is that terrorist incidents are increasing globally, and that is also the case for Africa. So fatalities from terrorist attacks in sub-Saharan Africa increased from <coughs> close to 4,000 incidents in 2013 to about 13,500 in 2014, although they dropped again <coughs> in 2015. Somalia and Nigeria were the countries that were host to the most terrorist incidents during this period. So what you're looking at here is a comparison between 2010 and 2016. We're no longer talking 2035, <laughs> but we need to know where we're coming from, right, to kind of think about the future, and in this case, not make any forecasts. So um, we can see the increase in violent incidents that I've been talking about. And if you look at, um, well, this is actually the actors. It's not, yeah, OK, it uh, tells us something, but, but it's actually about the actors that I was talking about earlier, that um, <coughs> there's increasingly more complexity. So rebels, political militias, and ethnic militias. So basically what this is showing you is, is um, <coughs> the increase in <coughs> political militias, ethnic militias, um, but at the same time also rebel groups. So it shows two things, the increase in violent incidents, but also the changing nature of the conflict actors that are involved. <coughs> On the next slide, because I mentioned earlier that <coughs> Much of this increase is also due to the significant increase in riots and protests over the last 10 years. So these three maps show the increase in, in um, riots and protest events in this period from 2006 to 2016. Um, so it's, it's quite significant. And Riots and protests, I mean, there's, you know, different motivations for that, from service delivery protests to just political um, <coughs> manifestations, demonstrations, even xenophobia. I mean, there's, there's different types, different motivations for riots and protests. Predominantly, these riots and protests happen in urban areas. So now this is linked again to... <coughs> what we said about urbanization and that violence in urban areas is also one factor that holds back the sort of potential of the urban transition, right? Because uncontrolled rapid urbanization in the context of poverty, inequality, youthful populations and lack of economic opportunities increases the risk of violence. That is what the literature says. And it brings me back to the part about the age structure of the population. So if, and we, I mean, we have a very young population, and it tends to be even younger in urban areas because young people, you know, move to urban areas more than older people do. Um, and if these young people lack opportunities, economic opportunities, but also political opportunities or opportunities in terms of voicing their um, concerns or to participate um, politically, then that is, that is a problem. And that is what increases the risk of violence, predominantly low-level um, violence. So it's not just, you know, young people are a risk. No, it is a risk if certain conditions are in place, which are unfortunately in place in, in most of Africa's urban areas. Um, so when we look to the future, basically what we're saying is that violence will remain a feature of Africa's future, 
which has to do with um, the structural drivers we talked about, demographics, also economics. We haven't talked much about that, but we're happy to answer questions. Um, we had to cut out some content to not overwhelm our audience. Um, the type of government is another factor that is also associated with the risk of conflict, democracies versus anocracies versus regime types that are somewhere in the middle that are typically associated with a higher risk of instability. Um, horizontal inequalities um, and structural imbalances. So horizontal inequalities basically is a measure of discrimination. It could be ethnic, it could be gender, um, things like that. Structural imbalance is a concept that <laughs> looks at, um, basically compares um, levels of economic development with levels of other um, indicators such as education, for example. So the, the best example we have for this is, is what happened during the Arab Spring because the income levels were relatively high if you compare to the, you know, to sub-Saharan Africa. <laughs> Still, <clears throat> there was a, like an imbalance between the level of economic development. Well, the imbalance was actually between the levels of education and the opportunities to participate politically in that case. So that's the kind of imbalances we're looking at. Levels of education were relatively high in the Arab Spring countries, but the opportunities to participate politically and also the opportunities to be a productive member of the economies, meaning, sorry, meaning, you know, having a job and so on and so forth, they're very limited um, because of the regime type that was in place. That's why we mentioned um, the bullet point regime type as well. Um, so I think I'm going to hand over to Zach again, who is going to present some scenarios. I gave you one earlier, the one about reducing fertility rates and, you know, but I didn't talk much about the implications of that. I, it was rather abstract saying it would kind of help with the earlier onset of the demographic dividend, which then implies economic opportunities. Um, but let me not talk too much and hand over to Zach. Thank you. Uh, actually, you had a couple more minutes. We might be done a little early, uh, but <clears throat> I'll try to, I'll try to, uh, you know, drone on as long as possible. I'm just, just kidding. Um, so uh, there's been a lot of doom and gloom in this presentation. I feel like uh, we've, we've. Well, no, I mean, it, it's. I think it's important to be honest about the challenges um, that, you know, those of us working to improve livelihoods in Africa face. Um, if we don't understand the challenges, it's hard to design uh, effective solutions. Um, so with that uh, being said, um, one of the, one of the um, most interesting aspects of the international futures model, and actually one of the reasons I got interested in the first place, was this alternative scenario of development. So what happens if we try to change things, right? So this is a current path forecast of poverty um, in absolute millions of people uh, until 2050. <clears throat> so the graphs I showed you earlier were only to 2035. So you, you actually see the number of the, the millions of people start to decline in this graph. So if we go out a little further in time, um, things do start uh, improving in an absolute sense, um, not just in a relative sense. Um, what I'm, what I'm going to show you is the impacts of three alternative uh, scenarios. One, where Africa invests in achieving universal sanitation in line with the Sustainable Development Goal target. Whoa. Another scenario is um, uh, where Africa aims to uh, achieve the 
SDG target related to communicable diseases. And then a third target is around um, SDG 16 and the improvement of governance on the continent. Now, the uh, SDG 16 doesn't um, exactly have hard targets for a lot of its um, objectives, but uh, what we did in the governance scenarios was um, similar to what we did with, with uh, the poverty uh, groupings earlier, we grouped countries um, based on their average, score, uh, average governance scores according to the World Bank Government Effectiveness Index. And we didn't, I mean, this isn't a scenario where, um, you know, all of Africa becomes like Denmark or Finland or something. Um, <laughs> what we did was we improved uh, countries with um, high levels of poverty uh, to the from the level of Djibouti to about the level of Tunisia in 2030. Um, for uh, countries kind of in the middle, we improved their governance score from that of Cameroon to something closer to Namibia by 2030. So these are changes that take place over 15 years um, and what we felt like represented a uh, aggressive but perhaps a reasonable um, uh, improvement in the levels of governance. So those are the those are the kind of parameters with which we design these scenarios and this is what I'll show you the the effect on poverty. Um, so if uh, Africa makes an aggressive push on communicable diseases uh, it does reduce poverty by about 16 million people by 2050. Um, you'll probably notice that it's causing a short-term increase. Now, this is something a lot of people find counterintuitive, um, but in a way that I feel like I, I kind of uh, highlighted before, health, um, health policies are often kind of the victims of their own success. In this case, uh, policies aimed at addressing communicable diseases. Because communicable diseases disproportionately affect uh, people in vulnerable communities, um, you know, helping those people may actually increase the number of people in poverty. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it does, you know, this, it goes along with the theme of um, strategic planning and unintended consequences of these policies. Um, so the communicable diseases takes a while to pay off, uh, but you do see some improvement by 2050. Uh, investing in universal sanitation, here you see a, a, a more immediate impact. Um, there's a kind of uh, a, a, a fairly extended period where there's not a lot of movement, um, but by the end of the forecast, you see a reduction in poverty of about 30 million people uh, below what we would expect in our uh, base case or current path forecast. Um, but finally, the uh, unlocking the future or the improved governance scenario, this results in a reduction of people living in extreme poverty of more than 60 million people by 2050. And again, this is with um, improvements in governance that are perhaps a bit idealistic, but not, um, not overwhelmingly uh, aggressive in our view. Um, so what are, the, what are the key takeaways from this research? Um, service delivery is a massive challenge uh, in Africa. This uh, is true across countries and across um, different types of not just uh, physical infrastructure but also so social infrastructure. Uh, Julia talked a bit about investing in human capital um, and, and, and developing social capital and you know this kind of social contract where uh, the government provides things to um, citizens and then citizens can demand things from from their governments and so on and so forth and you know one way of viewing that increase in riots and protests over the last few years could be that that citizens are becoming more participatory and demanding a more responsive government and that could you know could be viewed as a good thing um, so it's you know it's important to to try and to to think about these uh, with a a little more detail. Um, this, you know, I, I've, I feel like I've kind of hammered this point home, so maybe I'll just touch on it briefly. Um, there will be improvements in service delivery in a, in a relative or comparative sense, but um, 
the rapid population growth is going to make it difficult to reduce the absolute number of people without basic services um, in uh, you know a short to medium term outlook. Uh, sorry, I basically covered that. Um, this is the same will the same trend will hold for for poverty. Um, this is just kind of a a, a structural change that. Um, that policymakers in Africa are going to have to uh, incorporate into their decision making. And finally, I think we've we've tried to emphasize the the need for um, strategic planning across various levels of governance. What we didn't talk a lot about was uh, regional connectivity, um, and I think this is an area where the the RECs um, and uh, just you know even uh, bilateral country relationships um, could really facilitate progress in a lot of these areas. Um, infrastructure remains a challenge across borders, um, even in the Sadak region, you know, one of the more integrated regions of Africa. Uh, intra Sadak trade is still only about 16%, and if you compare that to Europe at 60% or ASEAN at about 35%, um, it's still well below uh, what other global regions have managed to achieve. Um, so I think, um, I think that about wraps it up. Uh, like to invite you to check out the report on our website um, and we look forward to a lively discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you both uh, Julia and Zach for, for that immensely informative uh, presentation. Uh, really not just going into the future which is which is what you you set out to do but then also looking at how some of the past trends and some of the the, the current uh, uh, data helps to inform that and, and hopefully helps to shape uh, the way in which policies um, as well as uh, actual implemented programs and projects um, in, in the future so they are quite a lot uh, and you've indicated just the four but there are quite a number of interventions um, I would imagine that would be necessary in order for those um, improvements to to happen and for those improvements to um, and, and and to twist a bit what what Julia said at the start for those improvements to be for everyone at the same rate and every way. So not in the way that we are foreseeing now, which is that for a lot of people, there will be improvements, but this will not have an impact um, or a positive impact across the, uh, um, across the African continent. But there was also something you said, Julia, which is that it's not unreasonable to imagine a prosperous Africa. And I think that's exactly it. Um, you, you ended uh, your joint presentation with the, the range of scenarios and the options that are there. And in that, for me, I was sitting here going, perhaps this is how we imagine or reimagine Africa's future, knowing what the challenges are and knowing what gaps they are, how then do you use the possible interventions that are there to ensure that we don't just imagine a prosperous Africa, but it actually becomes a reality. Noting, of course, that we are looking at a more populous Africa. We're not looking at 1.2 billion, but as you say, we're potentially looking at 1.8 billion Africans, of which the majority will be in urban spaces, of which the majority, if we don't have those interventions, will likely also be poor. But also, I think quite important from your presentation was that over half of the Sub-Saharan, uh, of Sub-Saharan Africa are under 21. For the first time, perhaps, at the ISS today, we have a great audience of people who are under 21. So I'd be interested to hear from, from the students in the room around what your thoughts are on Africa's future and what it feels like right now. Because, much as I look it, I'm not under 21. Um, and a lot in terms of some of the issues that we might need to look at also around what it is that is triggering an increase in violent crime or violence on the African continent, not only in particular countries, but also across the range of, um, of uh, sub-regions on the African continent. I noted in your slide regarding the, the increase of terrorist incidents, but also violent incidents generally, 
that in 2010 there was only but two dots in Libya and now the increase particularly noted on issues around organized crime, violent extremism and terrorism in Libya has increased so expon exponentially since 2011 that in fact Libya is one of the most unstable, unsecure countries on the African continent. Something needs to be done for a country like that to ensure that the region also doesn't suffer as a result. So there was a lot in terms of things coming from your presentation, um, not just the, 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 the numbers, which I think are quite fundamental uh, in helping us understand, because it's those numbers that are key to the way in which we plan. We're not planning for abstract beings, we're planning for people, like the ones in this room and the ones outside of this room, and to our online audience, I haven't forgotten you, we're planning for you too. And ultimately, it is about exploring, understanding, and shaping the way in which Africa's future goes. With that, and first, before I close the online stream, I would like to, to thank the people who have been tuned in online. The ones in the room, you still continue to have the benefit of the seminar. After this point, we will stop the live stream and we will have uh, discussions under the Chatham House rule, which means you're free to say whatever it is you want to say. You're free to ask questions, some of which would be difficult. Um, but should any of the responses touch you in a certain kind of way, please do not quote the person unless they've given you their permission. With that, thank you to the online audience, but thank you also to the German Embassy here in Pretoria with the support of the German Federal Office, and a huge thank you to the Hansaido Foundation for funding this work and ensuring that we're able to continue to project Africa's future and hopefully work to ensure that Africa's future is what we want it to be, not what it might be destined to be without intervention. I would also that the work of the ISS goes on, they keep the lights on, they keep us fed. I'd like to thank the members of our partnership forum, the governments of Australia, Canada, Denmark, Finland, Ireland, Japan, the Netherlands, Norway, Sweden, and the United States of America, and I hope in future that that list of countries includes developed African countries that are able to invest in Africa's future. With that, I would like to thank the online audience and say goodbye to you and we'll open the floor for more in terms of discussions. So thank you. Right, so what I'm going to do is a little bit...